Good morning, boys and girls. My name is Michael SK, and welcome back to Higurashi When They Cry, Chapter 3. It is morning, and I'm actually recording this when this video was supposed to go live, so... Sorry for the delay on this one. Was out having too much fun last night. And by that, I was just having a nice gentleman-like meeting. And by that, I was just chilling with the boys. But anyways, sorry for this video being late. Let us jump back into Keiichi planning a fucking murder. And that's not a lie. That is happening. And I don't know why he's come to this being the only solution. But we spent the whole last episode just planning things out. And we're still planning things out here. It was the first time I'd be calling Mion's house. I searched for her in the phone book the school gave me and then dialed a short phone number. The kind unique to remote places. It was around dinner time. She would probably be home. But just as I started to think nobody would respond, someone finally picked up the receiver. Wait, why, why is our voice sounding like it's on the other end of the line? She seemed to be in a weirdly good mood, she, and she drew her syllables out. Alright, it's the night before tomorrow's festival, so she's probably with her family having some drinks. I heard her draw in a small breath on the other end. Wow, you don't say. <laughs> The scent of sake had completely disappeared from her voice. <clears throat> you know, what still kind of confuses me, <clears throat> excuse me, is that I don't really know what triggered... Well, I, I guess I know what triggered her, you know, trauma to come up, but... It was just a head pat. And that worries me on why that was specifically a trigger. What did that bring up in Sotoko's mind? Just a head pat, you know? What caused her to flip out that bad? It must be something serious. And obviously, you know, just... She's, she's in a fucked situation, that's for sure. あんなになるまで俺たちは何も あいつを連れて行ってやってほしいんだ。それは構わないけど、どうして？どうしてって？せめて祭りの夜くらい息抜きさせてやりたいじゃないか。たとえ一夜でもあの意地悪なおじの元から離れられるなら短い時間でもき
別に押し付けるつもりなんかないよ明日の夜だけでいいんだ嘘だったじゃない What? Mion, what, what was she talking about? Honestly, it doesn't even sound like Mion. Like, it, in a way, this, from her emotional voice, I don't know, you know, if it's just because of, you know, her current emotions and, and, and all that, or maybe because she's been, you know, drinking in some of that alcohol, but she is sounding more like Shion, and we've talked with, quote unquote, Shion a lot. In the last in the last chapter. Oh, wait a minute. This is something the Satoshi asked of. Oh fuck. I had no idea what to say to that. Mion was clearly now talking to someone other than me. I didn't know who. All I could do was listen to her in a daze. When I said her name, whatever spell was on Mion was released. Oh, what, like a, like a year ago? Or whenever? Mion didn't answer. I mean, it's obvious. All I could hear were sobs coming through, coming through the receiver. Oh, you don't say. I had no idea how it had happened. But I was pretty sure that last year on this very day, Satoshi had called Mion and told her to bring Sotoko to the festival. And when she asked why he needed her to do it, he replied the same way I just did. You know, I, you know, I was going to say I hate to say it, but I really don't hate to say it. My suspicion is that Satoshi is pretty much, or he did pretty much the same thing that Keiichi is planning to do now. He is the one who killed the aunt and drove away the uncle. Maybe. Because that's how she died, right? Yeah, it makes sense why it would, you know, bring up that memory. Understandable. I didn't expect this. Satoshi had given her the exact same phone call one year ago today. After that, Mion had said more. That I... That he was lying. That he told her it would be or only be for the night of the festival. I mean, we're not planning on disappearing, right? Disappeared might have been a rather vague way to put it. Well, we might have we might not have a choice in the whole disappearance, but who knows? Whether he ran away or not, Satoshi left abandoning Sotoko. Did not mean to skip the last part of that. My uh, my dog's barking kind of spooked me. And then an idea far more indistinct than even fog crossed my mind. Satoshi made exactly made exactly the same phone call as me last year. Why would Satoshi make the exact same call? If in the truest sense he really made the exact same phone call as I am right now, then the incident where their aunt was beaten to death, that's... Could it? Last year, Sadako had been constantly abused by her uncle's wife, their aunt, too. Her aunt abused her the most. And on that night, in the name of Ayashiro Sama's curse, she was taken from this world. If I thought about that, everything made perfect sense, didn't it? 
サトコのおばが殴り殺されたじゃないかあれサトシってことは考えられないか No, but that would mean. But then Satoshi, he was a coward who abandoned Sotoko and ran away, wasn't he? How could Satoshi resolve himself to kill a person to save Sotoko? It was unthinkable. A few days later, he disappeared on Sotoko's birthday. When I first heard it, I flew into a rage. What a cruel day to have run away on. But. Now that I thought about it like this, the story changed completely. Satoshi had probably been even less calm than I was now. He was her big brother, related by blood, watching his little sister be abused day in and day out. Maybe that's why he couldn't keep calm. And that was why the corpse of their aunt, beaten to death, was so easily discovered. Satoshi lost himself in his anger and hadn't hidden the corpse. He'd permitted a beginning to occur. If the police conducted a full blown investigation, it was easy to imagine they wouldn't take long to pin down Satoshi as the culprit. Satoshi, he wished for a return to peaceful days with Sotoko, and though he achieved it for a time, he had been steadily driven into a corner, and then he wanted to at least hold out until Sotoko's birthday, but finally he, they nailed him. At the time, Satoshi had been carrying the savings he'd amassed to buy Sotoko a giant stuffed animal for a birthday present. He would buy the stuffed animal as her gift and then get caught. Or he could use the money and disappear. That was the choice he had been forced to make. And he decided not to make Sotoko the sister of a murderer. Alright. If that was the case, then it must have been an unspeakably bitter decision. All that money he'd saved wanting to, save, or wanting to see Sotoko happy, he had to use it to make her sad. And he used the savings and disappeared to Tokyo if the rumors were true. Hmm. Who is she? Had he been slowly driven into a corner by that repulsive man's pig headed pursuit? And that was right. The deviant had confessed and the incident was resolved. You couldn't just arbitrarily decide like that. You never know where or how humans are tied together. If that guy took the blame, then it was the perfect crime. Of course, it, if, if it was really a perfect crime, there would have been no reason for Satoshi to vanish. Could have been a coincidence. I didn't get it. After all that, I was understanding Satoshi less and less. The two of us fell silent. I couldn't remember how we even got on this topic. <笑>ごめん。どこで話がえ、本当かよ。祭りの準備でみんなで神社に行った時さ、佐渡子を祭りに呼ぼうって話になったんだよ。それで集会所の電話でそのまま電話して誘ったんだ。おじのやつ、よ
明日みんなで待ち合わせしていくことになってるんだよ安心したサトシーバカ俺はサトシじゃないって I was a little relieved I hadn't needed to make the phone call Sodoko had already been invited to the festival And not in a way that smelled of blood, a way to leave her uncle alone to create time for me to kill him. They purely wanted Sodoko to enjoy herself, so they invited her. In the end, it was the same, but I was happy for the slight difference. We apologized to each other for a little bit. As if interrupting our parting words, Mion struck straight where it had hurt. Where it hurt, excuse me. Yeah, what's her alibi? I deflected her with a response that wasn't really an answer. Mion didn't hound me anymore after that. Hmm. Satoshi. Satoshi Hojo, excuse me. Just who are you? I scorned you as a coward who ran away abandoning his sister. I always thought you didn't have the right to call yourself her Nini. But now I didn't know what to think. Oyashiro Sama's curse on the fourth year, their aunt's death, and Satoshi's disappearance. And now me trying to carry out Oyashiro Sama's curse on the fifth. Oddly enough, what I was going to do overlapped perfectly with Satoshi the day before the curse. No, that wasn't all. If we start back from Sotoko being abused, then I'd been overlapping with Satoshi for days already. When I talked to Mion before, she asked me if I was Satoshi. If that was the first impression a third party like Mion got, then it was probably true. Then, as Satoshi had accomplished, I would succeed in the murder. But that was the extent to which we overlapped. I was far calmer than Satoshi and more calculating. I could actually grow calmer the more enthusiastic I became. That's why I wouldn't follow in Satoshi's footsteps. I would snip him cleanly out of the world and then get our peaceful life back. Maybe Satoshi has been with me ever since I chose to use Satoshi's bat as my weapon. No, maybe even longer than that. When I decided I'd be her Nini, maybe Satoshi had been residing within me then too. Satoshi. Were you really a coward? Or are you a true Nini even now? A kind worthy of Sotoko's love? I'd never met him, never spoken to him, didn't even know his face, and yet I felt so connected to him. I'd never felt that way before. I just want to bring up I highly disagree with Keiji Think that he can be the calmest. I highly disagree with that. I mean, I've been, you know. Complaining that he gets so aggravated and pissed off and loud so easily. Note on the housewife murder case. All right. And our achievement possessed with a picture of a bat. Perfect. Well, let's read our tip for the attention of those on the housewife slaughter incident case. Our tips have been very boring this chapter. <laughs> It's just been information, which I guess that's what a tip usually is. J somewhere in July 1982. Okonomiya Police Station 1st Investigative Division. Chief Takasugi. Somewhere Prefecture Police Headquarters, er, headquarters for the eradication of drug related crime. Shishibone Branch Head is something. Regarding incident, something designated in undercover investigation, or as undercover investigation. This message is to inform you that a section of the testimony records of an incident under the, this police headquarters jurisdiction has been found. That is thought to be related to the undercover investigation of the incident in question. Okonomiya Police Station X, Hinamizawa Village Housewife Slaughter Incident. During investigation of subject whatever who was arrested or who was arrested for possession of illegal drugs, 
excuse me, there was testimony alluding to the crime in question, and it became clear that it contained information that only the perpetrator would have known. Therefore, we are prepared to share this record of testimony with you, duplicate attached. If this testimonial is to be believed, then there is an extremely high chance that the suspect was the perpetrator in the incident in question. In addition, on receiving this testimony, the head investigator on this case inquired as to the incident with the Okonomiya Police Station, but the responsible party at Okonomiya Police Station misunderstood, and in compliance with the designation as an undercover investigation by executive order from Prefectural Police Headquarters on July 1st, 1982, General, Administ General Administration B1-12, they did not explain the incident's existence to the head investigator as they should have. Because of this, the head investigator did not realize the importance of the testimony as it related to the case in question. And as a result, was negligent when combing the scene. We apologize for having effectively ignored it until now. In addition, there is a postscript stating that suspect somewhat died while in confinement yesterday. Ah... Interesting. Does that mean... Could that could that have been alluding to Satoshi? And that he was confined, but that information wasn't public? I don't know. I don't know what to take from that. Sunday. The fireworks I heard before noon were probably to announce the opening of the festival. And the weather certainly wasn't festival weather. It was cloudy. The television forecast was calling for possible downpours starting this evening and lasting until around midnight. But as long as it wasn't raining at the moment, the festival would go on. The festival had to open or it wouldn't begin. The Furude Shrine grounds were probably uh, decorated beautifully for the big performance that only happened once a year. Damn, this music is hitting. Hitting hard. Many paper lanterns were hung up, all in the auspicious colors of red and white. The sound of electric motors at the stalls, the voices of kids running around, their happy families watching them smiling. Today was the festival of Watanagashi. Was everyone already partaking in the festivities? What about Sotoko? Had she forgotten her days of suffering for just a few moments while smiling that brilliant smile that she hadn't in so long? This would probably be the longest day of my life. It would be a day I would remember vividly for as long as I lived. I told my parents I'd go to the festival this evening and lounged about during the early afternoon. We may have lived under the same roof, but they couldn't help but being surprised by the deviation from how I usually spent my time. Glancing at my parents out of the corner of my eye, I went to the front door. I tied my shoes just a little tighter than normal, as if to express the firmness of my resolve in those knots. When I decided to murder Sotoko's uncle, I was in such a state of excitement I almost went crazy. And when I was planning out the act of a murder, which went directly against all the morals fostered in me thus far, I was in such a state of calm I almost thought I had lost my emotions. And then yesterday, when I learned Satoshi had made the exact or made exactly the same phone call as me. I didn't know how to describe the muddled feelings I had then. And now entering today, right now I lacked all the emotions I'd possessed until now. To make a simple analogy, it was the kind of feeling you might get right after you wake up, when you're still half asleep and you don't feel anything very clearly. I had no anger towards that man for the violence he committed against Soroko. Nor did I feel sadness towards or sympathize with her. I felt no discontent towards my friends, who had just waited and watched, never reaching out to her with any help, and no nervousness or fear towards the day that had finally come. Yes, right now you could say I was in the best possible condition for carrying out a murder. When it came down to it, I would probably need to let my violent emotions take control. But right now, up until that moment, I would be like an insect. I would slowly, surely, and silently move towards my one objective, and then, when I had my prey, I'd attack like a bullet. There was no emotion in that, just the creeping mindset insects possessed. 
That sort of sneaking feeling was just the best. I would kill Sotoko's uncle like he was a worm. I had to laugh a little at thinking that way, thinking like an insect. Tug. I tightened my laces one more time and walked out the door. Okay, so I said this last episode or the day before. With, uh, with these thoughts that Keiichi is having, I believe this really does line up with the... Uh, I don't know if you can say definition, but really what is looked at in terms of psychopathy, what makes a psychopath, and yeah, this is, this is it, like, <laughs> to say, you know, fuck morals, like, this is the, the one solution, and just everything he's saying really doesn't feel like Heichi at all, from what I've seen out of these first two chapters at least. I don't know, just for him to come to this conclusion. I get that, you know, his friend is in absolute disarray, but for, for him to just come to this conclusion and make these preparations, like, it's just a, a normal activity that has to be done, like, like a chore. It's not normal, and it is something that I can describe as psychopathy. I brought the shovel out from the storeroom, or from the front storeroom, out of the front storeroom, goddamn. I would need it to dig the man's grave. The shovel was a convenient one made for camping. If I twisted it so and split it into three, I could easily hide it in my bag. I twisted the shovel and dismantled it. And even though I'd done it countless times before, I had trouble for some reason. Like I was suddenly clumsy now. I knew why. It wasn't because I was nervous. My weak-willed self deep within me was hesitant. I knew that the act of dismantling the shovel was the first step I'd take to becoming a murderer. <coughs> the last twist was conspicuously difficult, but it finally submitted before the strength of my determination. The area around Sotoko's house was outside my circle of activity, but even just riding my bike in the middle of the day like this might seem suspicious to an observant person. I definitely want to avoid meeting and talking to someone I knew. With that in mind, I chose the route to my destination carefully. I didn't mind going the long way around. With how long this day would be, I could never be too careful after all. Still, I was fortunate enough to not run across anybody on my way to the planned site of the crime. I wasn't superstitious at this point, but it was a good omen. The place I would dig the hole was in this grove, a little further into the woods. I was worried I might not make it to the same place as before, since there were no signs to guide me, but I arrived there smoothly and as, as, and as expected, excuse me. I took another look around. Not even a hint of human presence. The air was a little bit damp, but it was comfortable in the cool shade of the trees. I took the dis disassembled shovel out of my bag and began skillfully putting it together. Then I stuck the tip in the, uh, of the shovel into a soft looking patch of the ground and pushed it or pushed on it with my foot. The shovel would split into the earth if I put some strength into that foot. The act of doing so seemed awfully like the point of no return and it made me hesitate. I was just digging a hole with a shovel, but it made me gulp hard. Calm down, Keichi Maibara. Let's do a countdown. Get it done on the count of three, okay? Alright. One, two... I couldn't do it on the countdown despite it just being sticking the shovel into the ground. And I had to count down five or six times. Damn it. I'm just digging a hole. This is pathetic. As I thought that, I put strength into my heel like I was stepping on something unpleasant and split came the sharp noise. <coughs> yeah, digging a hole is really not the easiest activity. It was only soft at the beginning. Roots and stones quickly got in my way, informing me just how hard it was to dig a hole big enough for a person. No decent person would ever come here anyway. Maybe it would be enough to cover him up with some dirt. Every time a naive thought like that crept into my mind, a bit down, or I bit down on it with my teeth and dug even harder. I've dug enough now. I could hide him like this. Every time I thought that, I would go down into the hole, 
grow disappointed at how shallow it was, and return to digging. The thin layer of sweat on my brow eventually formed into drops and fell to the ground. My back was, e was in even worse shape. My damp shirt adhered to my skin, and it felt so disgusting. The things I couldn't stand the most were the mosquitoes. Maybe they were attracted by the scent of my sweat. The white and black striped mosquitoes would cling to me whenever I let my guard down. It was hot. It was disgusting. It was sticky. I was itchy. All those uncomfortable feelings surged through me in waves. <laughs> I hadn't yelled at anyone. It was me talking to myself, me telling myself something. Why was I feeling this way and digging a hole all the way out here? What benefit would digging this hole give me? What harm would there be in not digging this hole at all? Wait, in the first place, who ordered me to dig? When I thought it over, maybe ever since grade school or even before that, my whole life had been her had only been me doing what other people told me to. I didn't mean it was uh it was somehow constrained living a life just based on the commands of others, and I didn't mean I was too lazy to try and find my own road in life. Metaphorically speaking, yes, it was like a road. I think Heichi's just losing his mind to be completely honest. I had never been particularly physically fit. I didn't hit puberty very early, and if all my classmates and I got in a line, I'd usually be on the shorter end. My scores in jump rope competitions and marathons were the very picture of average, and it wasn't like the captains of the dodgeball teams would have a passionate rock-paper-scissors contest to see which would get me. During those kindergarten and grade school years, it felt like somehow, or someone was only worth how fast they grew and how it fit or how fit they were, looking back on it now, it was really uncomfortable for me. The thing that turned all that around was just a few words from my mother. The very first test I took at cram school was kind of like a game. It was a lot of fun. It wasn't like the tests with the same exact problem dozens of times in a row. Every question had a picture to it, almost like one of those puzzle books that came with manga magazines. If my studies at school had been like this, it would have been way more fun. Several days later, I went to the cram school again with my mother and the enrollment paperwork. Mom and the person at the cram school had a really long, heated discussion, so I accidentally dozed off and missed most of what they said, but I clearly remember one point. Mom had made a loud groan, surprised at something. いえ、違いますよ、お母さん。全国展開する当塾での平均偺差値が61です。簡易式の知能検査でも非凡な数字が出ています。まず申し上げて、前原圭一君は大変に頭がいい。圭一がでも学校では大した成績じゃありませんし
あなたどこかの本の雑誌の付録か何かで二重面体のサイコロを作ったことがあったの Dice only went from one to six. I had never even considered before this test that there were dice with more than six sides. So it was fun to imagine what kind of shape a die that went up to 20 would have. If I had a die like that, I would win at snakes and ladders against anyone. So I immediately wanted to make it. Finally, I entered、uh, cram school. There were only four students in the class they put me in, which was called Select. It was the highest class, and some of my classmates were in lower classes. And when I remembered how much better they had done at things like dodgeball and the 50 meter, 50 meter sprint, excuse me, I felt happiness well up within me for the first time. Even if I wasn't as good at them physically, I triumphed over them in other ways. It was fun at first. The more I did, the more I was praised. My teachers at school suddenly started pampering me, and it felt good. My parents were satisfied too. And I enjoyed seeing them satisfied. The more I listened to my parents' commands, the more, the more fun things got. <laughs> that didn't happen, didn't it? I grinned dryly in self deprecation. Because, well, my studious lifestyle didn't end up lasting very long. It was only at the beginning I enjoyed learning more and more. I gradually got along less with my friends. My classes were behind what I was learning in cram school, and I eventually stopped respecting the teachers, given that they could put me to sleep with their lectures. And well, I was a disagreeable sort who bragged a lot about how much I knew, and the ways of the world wouldn't let me remain in that state of ecstasy forever. I would do as I was told, and then I'd go above and beyond their expectations, and then they praised me. I was happy for that, and the cycle repeated itself like the wheels on a bike. I thought moving forward like that was how life worked, like a bicycle. When I moved to Hinamizawa, I realized just how inadequate it was. Some things happened, and we started staying, or saying how moving and getting a change in atmosphere would be nice. And then my father, he had a place that he liked, that he'd gone to a few times to draw the nature. He started saying that he wanted to bring his altier there.、Uh, with me in a blank amazement, they decided to move to Hinamizawa. And after that, I, I met them, didn't I? All right, we're getting a little backstory with Keiji. I don't know where this is coming from, but I'm all for it. So we'll stop here. Thank you all for watching this episode. Um, I'm actually all in for a little bit more backstory on Keiichi because through these chapters, sure, we knew him as like the kid that came from the city or whatever to Hinamizawa and just trying to trust the area and learn about all this wacky shit. But we never really knew much more about him other than that, you know, other than his dad being an artist for like hentai or whatever. But、um, yeah, this、I'm, this will be very interesting, I believe. You know, aside from all the murderous thoughts that he's been having, I think this will be a nice change of pace. So, next episode, we'll go through this and continue on with,、um, well, I guess his murder planning, because that's a thing now. Thank you all for watching this episode. If you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like, subscribe. Sorry again for the late episode if you guys are watching this as it comes out. And,、uh, well, see you guys in the next one. Take it easy.